Okay, hi everybody and well, good day here from Finland. We are continuing with our rays and the initiations discussion, especially in relation to the second part of the book. We've done, I don't know, maybe 16 or 17 of these um, additional commentaries after the first part of the book was pretty much written, written out for your study. In um, <clears throat> if you go to the Makara website, we've been looking at this very interesting diagram, and uh, I described what I thought I could of it, and that was the last uh, on the last <clears throat> program. These uh, funnels of ascension, I call them, and it pretty well shows us. Uh, the initiatory descent of man, ascent <clears throat> of man. We could reverse the, the funnels and get the uh, uh, upright funnel. We might call it the wizard's hat in a way, allowing us to move from a very broad area of experience to one which was much more uh, selective. And it would be um, just the reverse. It would be, in a way, a process of descent from a particular source into an ever widening area of possibility and then of course you could also ascend it does this does lead to the seven rays and we consider them to be the seven great planetary kumaras that are reflected in the group that um, stands around the lord of the world the three esoteric buddhas and the three buddhas of activity and also uh, there is this other kind of uh, reflection of the seven ray lords uh, in Shambhala, each one of them representing one of the seven <clears throat> major planetary Kumaras. So it's a very interesting um, chart uh, to have in mind. And um, now we will go on to number 51. <clears throat> And it tells us here, um, yeah, that it must be remembered that intelligence and love were present upon the earth, the first in greater degree than the second. I mean, when you consider probably the previous uh, incarnation of the uh, planetary logos, and, and this is also true of the solar logos, uh, we might say, for both the, uh, the planetary logos and solar logos, <clears throat> we are dealing um, <clears throat> with an incarnation, which, uh, incarnation now, which is succeeding an incarnation given to intelligence. Well, this is particularly so for the solar logos. You might say, in a way, uh, our planetary logos is now learning to express the, the love nature of its soul within the context of the same kind of process which is occurring for the solar logos. Maybe the different logo I reflect um, there, uh, <clears throat> what the solar logos is doing. And certainly we have had an initiation on our planet which reaffirms the intelligence aspect and are uh, moving more towards the second um, cosmic initiation of our planetary logos which as it concerns the astral body uh, not yet redeemed of our planetary logos it will have more to do with the love aspect and uh, Eventually, we'll be moving on into cosmic intelligence, just the way the solar logos is. The solar logos is beginning to uh, work uh, in the area of cosmic mind. And our planetary logos must do that cosmically as well. Uh, the, the big uh, expression in the next solar system will be that of the will, 
uh, it may represent the fifth or the sixth initiation of our solar logos. And if it's going to, uh, if the solar logos is going to take a kind of mastership, a cosmic mastership in our present solar system, then so must our planetary logos, as interestingly, our planetary logos represents the base of the spine center, which is necessary at the fifth initiation for a human being, and I presume for a solar logo, so the law of analogy holds up. So we have to be in that kind of position on our planet where a fifth cosmic initiation has been taken to activate us sufficiently to be the active base of the spine center of our uh, solar logos if he takes the fifth initiation. Of course, these are words, you know, and uh, all we have is the law of analogy. But big things are happening, and we're involved in this process, and if we could see things from a larger point of view, we might understand the uh, difficulties through which we are passing. So uh, the first... Uh, were present on Earth, love and love and intelligence were present on Earth, first in greater degree than the second, and the second will be <clears throat> gradually building, and that the task of all the great world saviors emerging from the secret place, what can we call that? Uh, can we call this the hierarchy? I think so in a way. Uh, <clears throat> from the illimitable past up until the present time, and notice that how he throws that in, this tells uh, us of the infinitude um, of universes, uh, let's see, no, okay, UNS, how's that, let's try that, UNS, because U is universe, and US is us, <laughs> universes, um, tells us of the infinity of universes which preceded <clears throat> our own, uh, has to anchor, organize, and implement these divine aspects, energies, and attributes, and to further their development uh, within the body of the planetary logo. So we have to ask, what does illimitable really mean? Are we to take this uh, literally, or does it just mean a uh, a great deal of antecedent time. Anyway, there are different world saviors. I think the Christ, you know, is, is a recent one, uh, our Lord Maitreya, but there's always been the head of the hierarchy, whoever that has been, going back millions and millions of years, <clears throat> when these heads were the product of earlier systems or earlier centers of development, like the moon chain, for instance, or even from the previous... Uh, solar system. So the world savior uh, takes certain very subtle characteristics and anchors them uh, into manifestation. Uh, and, and notice um, it's not only the second aspect of divinity, that I guess there's different ways to be generically a world uh, savior because it's the word is divine aspects, not just the second aspect. Though we tend to associate the idea of the world savior with um, with the second aspect of divinity uh, particularly <coughs> they also from time to time demonstrate to the humanity of their period of appearing you know the 2500 year period mostly uh the point in that development which had been reached the Christ was the ideal man, and he demonstrated for humanity what man could become. This is uh, in our modern times, the Christ demonstrated um, what man could become. The, these representatives of deity have been of all grades, degrees, and different points of spiritual development. Um, uh, I would suppose less uh, developed earlier in the planetary process. And there's a word that I always use, <clears throat> PLT. Whoop. I have to do it this way for the word planetary, as it is such a frequently used term. 
Okay. They have been chosen for their aptitude. Interesting about chosen, you know, well, maybe they, how did they achieve their particular place in the hierarchy, or do they not have to have been the Bodhisattva to be the world savior? Maybe not. Maybe they just have to be um, descending uh, avatar-like beings on whatever ray that add to the general um, uh, condition of salvation. They've been chosen, and I suppose chosen by whom? Well, uh, the hierarch of the time, uh, uh, Sena Kumara, I suppose, given our particular planet. They've been chosen for their aptitude to respond to invocation because there's a point of tension being generated from below and it's sent up. And the law is that when the invocation is sufficient, an evocation must lawfully follow. They've been chosen for their aptitude to respond to invocation, to manifest certain divine qualities, and to attract around themselves those who had latent the same divine qualities and could, and who could therefore step down the teaching that the world savior came to give and to translate into human, uh, excuse me, human equivalents, uh, as much of the divine inspiration as possible. So this is how this, this tells us how the world saviors are chosen, how they rise, who they are, what are their abilities. This is, <clears throat> I have never to forget my brackets. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, a story of their choosing and who accompanied them uh, to express their intention. Many of them have been forgotten, even if their work was successful. Such is the history of our planet. You know, we have a very short-term memory here, and... Uh, we ignorant human beings are functioning as if we've only got five or 10,000 years of real history, <clears throat> recorded history behind us when it's, as the secret doctrine tells us, in a mind-changing way, it's uh, far vaster than that. We really do have to get the principles of the secret doctrine out there so they can be at least uh, believed or at least given uh, uh, the possibility, hypothetically, of accuracy, so people can experiment and research and so forth. Uh, we we are too myopic in our view of the history of man, and it's just not uh, conducive to any kind of uh, wisdom in our actions. Many of these world saviors, many of them have been forgotten even if their works were successful. Others have been resolved into myths by the thought form making faculty of man, you know, like, you know, maybe um, like uh, Hercules, who apparently was a real Atlantean teacher. Um, that's millions of years ago. But their work is still thereby remembered, uh, we might say, because of the myths and their currency in the uh, human consciousness and memory. And to this, monuments and traditions constantly testify. Greater sons of God possess the potency and a love of humanity, which even at the close of many centuries evokes the attention of mankind and conditions even yet the reactions of many people, millions of people. So greater sons of God. Well, we can be indeed grateful for the appearance of these uh, teachers, uh, exemplars, uh, demonstrators, uh, those who uh, featured for us the appearance of divine aspects of which we would have no notion and idea. You know, we're all so very limited when we think what might be the future. There are divine aspects, the Tibetan tells us, which... Uh, of which we know nothing yet, and they're all going to be part of our future unfoldment, and they're all going to be part of that uh, statement which the Christ gave, that uh, greater things shall ye do. You know, I was thinking this morning, well, we all are the absolute infinitude, and nothing can be added to us or taken from us. Every, um, 
Every demonstration of a universe produces nothing new compared to the infinite possibilities which exist forever, but it does produce a kind of uh, drama and experience. Uh, it's almost as if the absolute infinitude needs the experience of limitation in order to be what it is, absolutely infinite, because the experience of limitation must be included in uh, the absolute the infinite possibilities. Anyway, that gets into philosophy and it's really hard to answer why any of this should be taking place. And I'm sure the reasons are far beyond human ken. I've sometimes thought they're far beyond the ken of any finite being, no matter how vast. Anyway, uh, we have uh, within our own uh, universal context, we have gratitude for these great exemplars. Uh, we can call them uh, <clears throat> Let us call these saviors uh, by the name exemplars uh, <clears throat> as well, or <clears throat> demonstrators, because otherwise our <clears throat> imagination is too poor to really get it. <clears throat> the original Vyasa, the original Vyasa, now I guess that means, you know, there have been others succeeding the original Vyasa who took the same name, just like the Patanjali's. One of my co-workers once uh, using the remark that there was Patanjali, you know, Patanjali. <laughs> Sounds like a comic team, but Patanjali, I think, is the, maybe a more dignified way of pronouncing it. Vyasa, the original Vyasa, who was a great individuality, evoked by the invocation of early animal men, is still, is still more than just the name. Even though he has passed out of planetary, the planetary scheme, millions of years ago. He's still more than just a name. Well, he obviously is more than just a name, but to many, I suppose he's just a name. <coughs> Excuse me. To many, I suppose he is just a name, uh, but for what was he, he responsible? R-E-S-P? Yep. He uh, opened the door into the human kingdom through his response to the animal kingdom in its higher invocative ranks. So he, uh, he was inseparable from the process uh, of um, an individualization. Okay, I think... Mm -hmm. I'm going to use that one if you don't mind. INDZ. Um, individualization. Alization. And uh, without uh, him, apparently, this uh, 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 for our Earth, uh, Earth humanity. And um, <clears throat> let's include that as well. And that will be. Uh, Earth, humanity, E-A-R, uh, the technicalities of spelling, for our Earth humanity, maybe not for moonshan humanity, okay, but for our Earth humanity, he opened the door. What a profound statement, a great individuality. What did he do, you know, that made this possible? We just have the fact by given by the Tibetan that he did this, how he did it, we don't know. <clears throat> His work brought about the process known as individualization. Hmm. Okay. I've never seen it so clearly expressed. Down through the ages, these sons of God have come, evoked by human invocation. This is an absolute law. Uh, this uh, ask is an absolute law. If you ask, it must be answered. You must be given. You, know, you must receive. If you seek, you must find. If you 
knock, it will be opened unto you. You know, that reminds me, you know, that, that my wife Tui and I are doing this uh, series called Ask. It's uh, a memorable name, but it really is all about the, uh, the law of invocation and evocation. So these sons of God have come, evoked by human invocation. In their turn, they have invoked certain aspects of the divine nature, uh, deeply hidden in mankind. So a, a, a reciprocal invocation, whoop, invocation has occurred through the evocation, which our first invocation summoned. I hope that's uh, easy enough to understand. In other words, their, their evocation might be an invocation of us to respond in a still higher way. Their answer might be to invoke certain latent possibilities, which we have. All this is going on, you know, and uh, is the universe a friendly place? Uh, is there an ongoing universal benevolence? Uh, yeah, I would say, I would say so. And as terrible as things may seem at times, we always rise out of the dream and realize that we are essentially and really part of something extremely archetypally beautiful. And thus, what <clears throat> D.K. calls the eternally lovely secret of death. So, so they have invoked certain aspects of the divine nature, deeply hidden within us, all related hitherto to consciousness and to the responsiveness a part of the whole. So it's uh, maybe not so much the will as um, sensitivity and consciousness. Eventually, Hercules came forth. This is uh, eventually, so it must have been a long time. So in other words, uh, there must have been... Uh, Let's just call it Lemurian exemplars. And of course, Vyasa was that. I mean, he came in the middle of the Lemurian period when individualization occurred. Now, you know, how it occurred on the moon chain is a little different. Uh, and the solar angels were not involved, but maybe there were exemplars at that time who helped with the process. Eventually, Hercules came forth with his rays, soul ray one, personality ray two, says the Tibetan, uh, soul ray uh, SLR. I think that's a good way. SLR. So the logo says SLR. <clears throat> soul ray. You don't want to forget your soul ray once you have it and are sure of it. Soul Ray, uh, the first, uh, and Personality Ray, the second, and open the door onto the path of discipleship, uh, through, we might say, through his dramas, through the education that the, uh, Herculean dramas gave to the humanity of the period. So through his dramas, you know. It's not that Hercules uh, himself did these things in any objective way. They were uh, presented to us as imaginative labors which made their uh, impression upon the consciousness of humanity of the time and maybe raised them to their higher possibilities uh, so some could tread the path of discipleship. <clears throat> His work being preserved for us in the Twelve labors of Hercules, uh, you know, of which the Tibetan, there are many versions of these, and uh, the Tibetan um, wrote out the first seven labors, you know, and in a way, uh, although it would be in a way the undoing of the work of uh, five other individuals, it would be wonderful if he could write out the last five when he again appears. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know who he'll have to offer commentary the way Alice Bailey did. Will it be Alice Bailey again or some other initiate? But it would be wonderful if the master's touch were involved with these labors because you can really tell uh, as hard as the succeeding or succeeding writers attempted, 
they aren't the Tibetan. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't do what he did, and they probably left out very important aspects, which he seemed to bring in because of his much vaster knowledge. So Hercules came forth and opened the door onto the path of discipleship, his work being preserved for us in the Twelve Labors of Hercules. These epitomize the various tests to which all disciples are subjected prior to the various initiations. And uh, let's just say, uh, note, uh, note this word prior. There are certain uh, important processes, <clears throat> uh, certain important, oh, how about spelling, huh? Certain important uh, processes which occur before initiations. And, um, you know, and some of these are actually given, some are given, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the labors of Hercules uh, are, uh, demonstrate some, and also some, and uh, also the formulas found in, uh, <clears throat> it's a new keyboard for me, Dinah to uh, offer others. You know, the uh, there are six formulas, and they seem to deal not so much with the initiation themselves, but with uh, that which must be perfected in intermediate periods uh, before initiations. So, whoop, that's not it. Okay. Uh, I don't know what I just did. I think I just refreshed something. Well, that's not what I want to do. Anyway, the uh, LOH, and we will call it, as we have in the past, Labors of Hercules. And we're all laboring. If you just um, look at yourself, you'll find yourself laboring at one or more. Uh, one or more uh, of these labors, depending upon your sun sign or your rising sign. <clears throat> because after all, uh, the ray, all, the, everyone has to do them regardless of their ray. Um, the ray will modify perhaps how they're done. But uh, we must engage. We must engage in these, uh, in the working out of these labors. And it, and it, I think it must be um, very interesting to see. You know, I, I have a lot of Aries in my nature, and I wonder, you know, have I gathered the man-eating mares uh, only to turn them over to my personality, who then did a bad job of it? Or have I been chasing after the <clears throat> the golden hind with the cancer ascendant, uh, trying to cultivate the intuition? And uh, have I been bringing it to the Temple of Apollo only to discover that it's always free and everybody can access it and so forth? Uh, the uh, the amalgam of the particular labors that you are passing through, I think, will be very important. It's not just one labor. It is. It has to do with your sun sign, but your rising sign, as you begin to cultivate it, also suggests a labor in which you are involved as you build in the necessary uh, qualities. Okay, so we go further. Uh, I, I love this material about the former teachers, and obviously a lot of them are being left out. We owe such a tremendous debt of gratitude to the great teachers that have uh, gone before us. But then, you know, if you really philosophically look at it, we've been teaching ourselves, you know, um, not so much as individuals, but as an essential being, which we all are. And the different aspects of ourselves have been teaching the different aspects of ourselves. Sri Krishna came and opened the door through which mankind could pass to the second initiation. And, you know, uh, the Buddha uh, was uh, more involved in the third initiation, although he was surrounded by arhats, we are told. The Buddha, a still greater figure, and, and now, you know, and look at it this way. The Christ is, was, Sri Krishna. 
So the Buddha, Gautama, we usually call him that, um, is always a little ahead of the Christ. After all, he started in the previous solar system. Every indication is of that because somehow he summarized within himself the wisdom of the previous uh, solar system. So it's still a greater figure, or does it mean a still greater figure at the time he appeared? Krishna was appearing some 3,000 years ago, but that's um, the, the death of Krishna is at 3,002 BC. Anyway, that that's about the time that the Buddha took over his uh, headship of the spiritual hierarchy, then giving it after that to Sri Krishna appearing as uh, Lord Maitreya. So they really are cooperating, and it's just a shame the way the um, the adherents of these two religions don't recognize that their uh, founders were in the greatest of cooperative modes. I was in um, was I in China at at a at a certain time, maybe back in 1991, and I thought, well, I'll talk to a Buddhist monk, but. He was there at the temple, but all he could do was rail against Jesus or rail against Christ. You know, it wasn't exactly what you would figure. But then, you know, there are adherents of religion. Uh, they're going to get there, but they still are in the lower echelons of understanding. And uh, I have friends and uh, relatives and so forth who <laughs> rail against the Buddha because they are of the Christian persuasion. So we, we are the victims of the limitations of our consciousness until we are no longer the victims of those limitations, you know, and uh, and we look back and say, how could have I, how could I have believed that? How could I have had such a limited point of view? Even right now, you can look back on your life or supposedly upon your lives and uh, and, and, and say that to yourself and realize it. So the Buddha is still a greater figure, the one who is known as the enlightened one. And you know, why? Because, uh, in my view, because uh, he took an initiation, the sixth, in relation to the cosmic mental plane. Well, now, cosmic mental plane is definitely something we need to have, don't you think so? I wonder how many of us will ever come uh, while we are still uh, Chohans or becoming Chohans in touch with the cosmic mental plane. Okay, he took an initiation, the sixth in relation to the cosmic mental plane, also came and demonstrated to humanity the nature of the lighted way. Uh, its uh, influence upon discipleship, its revelation and its effects in consciousness. He acted for us, and acted for us, the supreme achievement of the mystic way. But of course, uh, as the head of the spiritual hierarchy, uh, he knew occultism inside and out but he had to demonstrate perhaps something else. Uh, and this is uh, going to be uh, SPH and um, <clears throat> spiritual hierarchy. Okay. <clears throat> then came the Christ, you know, Krishna, uh, Lord Maitreya, and performed the triple work. He opened the door to the third initiation. Well, okay. Maybe, you know, literally this is so. Did the Buddha open the door to any initiation at all? Well, he was surrounded by arhats. So, uh, you can say this much. The Buddha uh, was surrounded by arhats or, or becoming arhats. So, he was dealing with the initiation of some. But the Christ uh, here says, has opened the door to the third. He anchored on earth the will of God in the matrix of love, as it has been esoterically called, and uh, not just the will of God, as that can be dangerous uh, for men uh, who do not love 
sufficiently as we have seen in the Second World War with those six or so, or, you know, with Hitler seven, who got the inverted Shambhala energy uh, without, uh, outside the matrix of love. He pointed the way through the needle's eye, which gives entrance to the passage through the pyramid, the symbol of the spiritual triad, in this case, S-A-A-B, helping to enlighten us, which leads out on the way which terminates uh, in Shambhala, the higher uh, initiations, um, but not yet all of the way of higher evolution or the ways of higher evolution. And uh, the needle's eye. Well, um, let's just say uh, the needle's eye uh, is usually okay. Usually considered the entrance to the fourth initiation. So the Christ was pointing uh, toward the fourth initiation as he demanded that we give up the fruits of the third initiation, as he did with the rich young man. Christ demanded uh, that we sacrifice the fruits of the third initiation, as uh, he did with respect to the uh, rich young man who made the wrong decision at that time, uh, and uh, thus give up the causal body uh, or the uh, the old globus. Some, some, sometimes, you know, we just don't want to give up that beautiful temple in which we are ensconced because it seems to be the receiving point of so many wonderful energies, and maybe we don't have uh, sufficient faith in how uh, in what lies beyond. You know, we think that this is everything, and and one of the great sins or mistakes that that groups make, people make, is to think they've got it all and there's nothing beyond the revelation that they are presently experiencing. It's a very dangerous thing because then they consider every other possible revelation a kind of heresy which has to be stamped out. And we get the wars between the religious groups and the terrible misunderstanding and all of that because of the limitations of the concrete mind and the lack of faith. <laughs> Excuse me. His uh, work was of a major consummating nature. He demonstrated in himself two divine aspects, thus giving shape and substance to love. This is interesting. So, uh, do uh, the shape and substance refer uh, to the third aspect uh, of divinity? I'm, I'm not sure the will, the will is going to be involved here. He's going to demonstrate the will. So let's see what DK does say. Um, this had been sequentially fostered by several preceding lesser world saviors of whom Sri Krishna, the earlier incarnation of the Christ, was the greatest. Uh, he was one who fostered love, and still there are devotees of Sri Krishna. If, if only they could understand... Uh, the continuity of reincarnations, they would be more inclusive and able to uh, embrace the earlier demonstration and be enhanced in their understanding by the later demonstrations. But, you know, we have to overcome the Saturnian aspect of limitation before the great revelations can be ours, and it's so hard for trembling man, you know, frightened man, limited man, to give up what he considers to be his security blanket <laughs> of the moment. So, uh, anyway, uh, love had been fostered. The Christ completed the work of the Buddha by manifesting in its fullness the nature of love. Uh, the, the Buddha had plenty of love and compassion, no question about that. But the Christ was, uh, well, you know, here's the reason, I think. Uh, the Christ is a monad of love, and the Buddha is, uh, despite mm, his uh, second ray soul, oh, SRSL, 
second race soul, uh, is a monad of intelligence, a third ray monad, and that is just, uh, although it's not stated directly, it's stated in such a manner in cosmic fire that it can't be anything else. Is that the Buddha and nine others can put in three appearances simultaneously, and this is only possible for third ray monads. Thus permitting the full expression of love wisdom in its dual aspect, the Buddha demonstrated the wisdom, of course, the one aspect demonstrated by the Buddha and the other by the Christ. So the wisdom aspect needed uh, the love aspect to be added to it. Um, needed the love aspect to be added to it in such a way that uh, both could be simultaneously demonstrated. But his greatest work has not yet been emphasized in the worlds of thought and religion, the revelation of the way of higher evolution at the sixth degree. Amazing. Okay. Wow. You know, sometimes you run into something you've read a long time and Oh, okay, so the Christ, the Christ demonstrated um, the revelation of the way of higher evolution. Okay, and we're going to put that in revelation, if we can only spell and type what we know. Revelation, okay, good. Uh, this entails the bringing through a pure divine will at the sixth degree and the relating of the spiritual hierarchy to the great council of the Chambala, uh, which apparently had, um, had not yet been done before the Christ did it in the Garden of Geth. Semene, G-O-G, if you will. Okay, we'll call it the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Oh, that's Bethsemane. I want to. Okay. <clears throat> In the, oh, come on. Yeah, Gethsemane. Okay. So bring it through of pure divine will, not my will, Father, but thine be done. The great uh, Piscean pronouncement having to do with contact with the council chamber. So let's just say when we read, uh, not my will, but uh, thine be done, it refers not to the pain of the of the crucifixion, um, but to the acceptance of the of the divine will at the sixth initiation. Okay. So think about that. It's um, it's not something that we normally give credit for, to. We usually think of the pain uh, that Jesus underwent on the cross and that we will all have to undergo in one way or another, uh, passing through the fourth degree. It will be apparent to you, therefore, that he was the first to carry through from stage to stage the complete revelation of humanity uh, to the hierarchy and of the hierarchy to Shambhala. Hmm, the complete, I would I would have said relation, but uh, he says revelation. Uh, you know, so obviously it's correct here, but uh, also, let's just say, also relation. But uh, <coughs> the revelation of humanity to the hierarchy well, does hierarchy already know what's in humanity, or in what way is this revelation occurring? You know, a, a, a giving up of all we are uh, to the next higher center, a complete exposure of everything we are, the giving up of our will, 
and the uh, showing forth of all we are in the light of the next higher center, showing forth of, of all we are in the light of the next higher center. Well, the word relation seems correct to me, but, you know, sometimes... Um, Mm. Sometimes a word is correct and it doesn't strike you as why it is correct until you think on it further. So here's the word revelation of humanity to hierarchy and of hierarchy to Shambhala. Normally one would think that um, the greater center knows the less and does not need to be revealed, but maybe it will tell us right here. <coughs> this he did by virtue of a completely finished and constructed Antikarana. So you would think more it's the revelation of the greater center to the lesser. Um, so a completely finished and constructed antikarana up to the sixth degree. And thus he facilitated, facilitated the work of all future aspirants. So, you know, he, the Christ, um, he, sorry, he, rent and he built what they do we rent the veils allowing the revelation of the higher energies to the lower and uh, no longer to be blocked by the uh, etheric conditions and in general the conditions of the three lower worlds and then he also built this uh, cable along which others could ascend the bridge he made possible their unimpeded progress because he overcame the gaps as far as the opening of each stage of the planetary antikarana is concerned. Notice there are other antikaranas. There are other antikaranas, and if I don't have to use the word ants, A-N-T-S, I will say antikaranas. <laughs> All right. So... He presented the first thread of living substance, irradiated by love, intelligently woven, and energized by will, as all Antikaranas are, which any human being on our Earth, of our Earth humanity, had uh, interwoven with the planetary Antikarana. So uh, he presented, he, he lifted up all of our product in a way. He presented the first living substance, first thread of living substance, He's always gathering up what we do and presenting it to a higher source. An energy is by will, but which any human being of our Earth, humanity had interwoven with the planetary uh, Antikarana. So uh, he gathered the product uh, of our labors as he does at the uh, Festival of the Christ and presents them, um, excuse me, to higher energy centers. Okay, well, this, this really has to be pondered, because that word revelation threw me just a little bit here, so I have to find the way in which it, you know, uh, operates. Maybe you will know. Uh, here lies the secret of the sixth initiation, which has not yet received the attention of the occultist, it is that of the ascension. But this is important. Um, the sixth initiation is the ascension. Of course, it's also possible to ascend to the Father and sit at his right hand. And um, you kind of think of the Father as living or focused on the logoic plane of the cosmic physical. <laughs> and the Christ, being a becoming seventh degree initiate, can sit there with the Father. Um, so, you know, does the ascension lead to the sixth uh, plane? It does, and and can it lead beyond? Uh, there, there's nothing but further and further ascensions. So it can lead to the seventh degree too. Uh, but I, I think um, uh, one gets the sense, is the Christ fully and completely established on the Logoic plane right now? And, you know, and what really would that mean? He certainly has the freedom of Shambhala as he is the great uh, <clears throat> agent 
of the loving will of uh, the Lord of the world who must f uh, be focused in the highest level of Shambhala, which must be on the Logoic plane. But this is the point. He presented the first living thread, first thread of living substance irradiated by love, intelligently woven, energized by will, which any human being on our Earth humanity had interwoven with the planetary Antikorana. He's always, um, what can I say? It seems um, the Christ uh, is always taking the work of humanity many steps further than humanity itself uh, could do. Okay. <clears throat> So in this respect, he really is the savior and uh, a great uh, boon to uh, the ascending humanity. Okay, here comes a climaxing note. The whole evolutionary scheme is based on, okay, upon a series of ascension, ascensions. I don't know if I've got cryptonesia here, you know. I've, I've read this maybe quite a few times, and um, <laughs> when I seem to be, and saying something, and then it's said a few uh, sentences later is probably the result of previous reading. Here comes a climaxing note. The whole evolutionary scheme is based upon a series of ascensions. The increase of contact with higher and higher vibratory realms. These ascensions are the result of a process, a technique, a method, choose which word you will, of invocation by the lesser Individual, group, or kingdom, and the evocation of that which is greater, more inclusive, and more enlightened. So, uh, ascension is related to the process of invocation, um, evocation. <clears throat> and so, you know, and, and of course, invocation is related to the process of aspiration, which is said, uh, which is said to be not an, a, not an emotional process, but a scientific technique. <clears throat> Invocation is related to the process of aspiration. This is true whether it concerns a, a lonely aspirant. Interesting about lonely because, you know, our group consciousness has not been completely realized when we are the aspirant. Whether it concerns a lonely aspirant upon the way, or, and that's the lower way, or an entire kingdom of nature. Sometimes the word way means simply the path and not the way of higher evolution. So the word way can simply mean the path or an entire uh, kingdom in nature. The greatest of the incarnating sons of God are necessarily those who can include whole kingdoms or states of divine being in their consciousness. Well, what can we say of us? Let us at least include our group and not be so individual, uh, in individual that we include only the usual ring pass knot of our consciousness. Here is the key as to why the invocation by the group, standing with massed intent, can bring forth and has done so many times uh, in our planetary history, one who could meet the need, which the invocation voiced upon the way of escape, uh, and that is the Antikorana, and embody in himself uh, the required vision or goal. Well, you know, think of it. Um, so, toy. Okay. Maybe I'll use that quite a bit <clears throat> when I say, uh, think of it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> think of it <clears throat> how the inchoate demand of humanity during the Second World War brought forth the, uh, one of the Lords of Liberation, probably the one specifically associated with liberation and freedom rather than equality and fraternity. And uh, thus, uh, 
uh, civilization was saved. And probably humanity was saved as well. Who knows what disaster could have resulted if the uh, forces of darkness representing um, represented by the Axis powers had achieved the atomic bomb before the Allies did, representing as they did imperfectly the uh, forces of light. You will note here that I've carried the teaching earlier given upon the subject into a, the realm of the whole. Yeah, I, I've been thinking to myself, haven't I read this before and elsewhere? And um, DK is constantly expanding our picture. And we have to keep up with it. Previously, I dealt with the process that, as it applied to the disciple invoking his soul. Later, I carried the concept farther, and we considered the disciple invoking his father in heaven, the monad. That's the usual, you know, building of the Antikorana. Now we have briefly touched upon humanity as a whole, standing at a great point of invocation wherein the higher, entire human kingdom is involved. And presently, we are, uh, whether we know it or not, we are invoking the Christ. <coughs> as a representative uh -huh. let me do this REPV and that's going to be representative as a representative of the will of the father of the excuse me of the will of the father thus you have the final three of the six great stages in the process we are considering, invocation leading to evocation. Firstly, there must be sufficient tension in the evocation, invocation to revelation at the fifth initiation and to decision at the sixth. So we might say, I, I wonder how we can do this, but uh, is um, revelation related to stabilization? Is uh, decision related um, into, um, what's it called? Oh, yeah, resurrection. Well, in a way, if resurrection is ascension. I mean, you know, these are words, and uh, sometimes we can just choose the word as long as we get the idea. Well, it's a long summary, so I'm not going to get into it <coughs> Excuse me. until the next program number 52. So this is then uh, the end of Raised and Initiation Webinar Commentary, number 51, pages uh, something uh, up to 528. It would be nice always to know where I started from, which I never seem to remember. 526, 528. It seems like we covered so much ground, and yet you know, only a couple of pages can pass. So it's very rich material, and, uh, you know, um, obviously you can read this yourself and come to your own conclusions, and what I'm simply trying to do is offer some uh, additional thoughts of an associative nature, which may uh, help to bring more light upon the subject, at least that is my hope. And certainly helping me, I mean, you know, having the opportunity to read over this in a very uh, attentive manner. Uh, is really refreshing in my memory and adding much to it. Beginning of Ray's and the, uh, uh, much to my understanding, Ray's initiations number uh, 52, and we're beginning um, pages 528. Uh, <clears throat> and where are we? And what date is this? Uh, I don't know if that's important, but this is the 29th of January, 2017, and we'll see when we can uh, 
go further. And what are we summing up here, actually? We're summing up, uh, let's just put it like this. We are summing up, um, we are summing up uh, humanity's um, HU great approach and the uh, sons of God who are assisting that approach uh, throughout the ages. So we'll leave it at that for the moment and um, continue when we can. I have guests in the house. It's always difficult to know. I'm stealing a few little minutes here in the uh, Temple of Silence <laughs> while other people are doing other things as I'm trying to plow through this material to get it to you in a reasonable way, knowing what it's like not to be able to spend an entire year doing that which I intended. So I'll, I'll capture these moments as best I can. All right, so that's it for the moment, and thank you very much for being here for number 51. See you soon. Bye-bye.